Hi, I'm pleased to introduce Lou Carbone. Lou Carbone is the founder, president, and chief experience officer of Experience Engineering, a Minneapolis-based consulting firm dedicated to customer and employee experience management. He is widely regarded as the father of experience of the experience management movement. Uh, founded in the late 1980s, Experience Engineering helps companies discover what really makes customers tick and offers solutions to help them increase customer satisfaction, loyalty, and repeat business. Please join me in welcoming Lou Carbone. Hi, Lou. Hi, Tom. Thank you very, very much. Really looking forward to uh, this day uh, for quite a while. Very, very excited and excited with the great work that you're doing there. If it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. And magically, we should have the presentation up. And I believe, whoop, I believe we can see my screen at the moment. Yes, we can. Excellent. That is great. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to chat uh, and, and talk with uh, a group that I so much admire uh, and be part of this day and this presentation. Uh, I'd like to begin, if you will, uh, by talking about creating a differentiated experience and uh, so proud of uh, the fact that some of our work has actually been written about uh, in terms of work that we did around uh, John Deere financial services and John Deere and bringing the brand to life. And it was actually written up in a book by two incredible authors and uh, Dan Heath and Chip Heath uh, that wrote about the John Deere first day of experience, uh, your, your first day at work. And it was a program that we launched globally in India and, and uh, through, through Asia, through South America. And at the base of this photo, what you'll see is what we refer to as an experience blueprint, which is the experience design and the elements that are actually in that uh, experience in the way that it's actually created and, and uh, how we articulate clues or signals in that experience. So as we look at that work, uh, what I'm so excited about today and hope that we can talk about and think about is I know this is a day of really studying best practices, but we are in the infancy of the potential of experience management and what it means to business, but most importantly, what it means to people, what it means to the individuals and the people that we serve in the businesses that we're in and the success of those businesses. And there's this continuous need to continue to look to the, to the future as we learn from the past and understand that there are next practices that become critically important. So when we think about this, what is so critical is that the world has suddenly come to realize that experience is not just about customer experience, but it's customer and employee experience, and it deals with a business design. And there's a huge difference between being customer centric and customer driven. And the world is moving to being more customer driven. And that's an important factor as we look forward and we look at the world as it's changing and as it evolves. For me, I was struck by lightning somewhere around 1979 during the construction of Epcot Center and being able to work with people at Disney and you'll see that Epcot Center is actually under construction behind me. 
It was like I was struck by lightning. My life will never ever be the same because here we're talking about the temperature and the velocity of the wind blowing in your face in Spaceship Earth. Most other organizations weren't even aware that people breathed oxygen. This changed my life forever because it was there that I realized that you cannot not have an experience. It's a question of how haphazard or how managed that experience is. And in dealing with that, I think it's so critical to come up with a simple understanding. There are so many definitions of experience, but what is an experience? Experience, it really is an event or an occurrence that leaves an impression on someone. It's that simple. It's that, that impression. An impression is a feeling. It is how we feel about ourselves and the experience that we just had. So, and looking at a managed experience, it's the net intentional takeaway of that impression. Using an understanding of both emotion and rational effect that's formed when humans consolidate sensory information through their exposure to clues or signals that are produced by a brand or a company. So when we look forward to this world of experience, the world that I have studied so deeply is this concept of clues. What are the clues, both conscious and unconscious, that literally affect our emotions? And it's that effect on our emotions that literally begin to shape our attitude toward a business. That leads to driving behavior, ultimately. Where most of the work in previous generations has been is really understanding the attitudes, how people feel, and what their behavior is. That was the world of basically customer satisfaction to, to a degree. But what we need to begin to understand is in experience 2.0 is the effect that clues have that shape those emotions that drive attitudes that ultimately drive behavior. So we talk about an experience preference model. There are clues and signals that are negative. There are clues and signals that are commoditized. And there are those clues and signals that we remember, that we continually recall, that made a deeper impression. That impression is the repetitiveness of an emotion or a feeling over and over and over again. So when we look at the world, the traditional view of brand and the way that we looked at brand was around this idea that, you know, it's how do you feel about me, the company? What becomes ultimately so critical is we began to realize that service was an aspect of the product. So brand tended to be very focused on product service tended to begin to look at treatment, how to treat people. But what total experience is about is how we cause a customer to feel about themselves. And those feelings with emotional integrity end up reinforcing that ultimate brand. It's like making a reinvestment in the capital value and valuation of your brand and reinforcing that. So let me give you just a couple quick examples that I've lived through in my life of, of, of experiences. This is a barber shop in uh, Toronto, Canada. And out of this barber shop was a scent. The scent reminded me of uh, a scent that my grandfather and my dad used that was uh, highly exclusive and had very limited distribution. It was distributed only in uh, drugstores, 
and supermarkets. It was aqua velva. And uh, that scent coming from this barber shop really attracted me. And uh, I went into the barber shop, and here everyone's wearing white coats. They had given me slippers to wear. I had cookies. I had tea. And it said, uh, Barbers to British royalty since uh, 1805. I never once in Toronto, Canada, tried to understand uh, how British royalty got their hair cut there. Uh, but it was a clue. It was a signal. And here the barber was so precise in cutting hair. And uh, when you have uh, not a lot of hair to spare, precision becomes important as I watched them scissor and cut. They had name tags and uh, I got a haircut. It was an incredible uh, moment. I was so taken by the haircut that I ended up getting a shave and I don't even shave. I <laughs> got this wet shave and, and uh, it was absolutely astounding. So after this, uh, we go to a presentation with my team and I am on cloud nine. I am feeling so confident and uh, we ended up getting this project with a large Canadian bank before the elevators hit the first floor after we presented. So I said, let's go out to dinner and celebrate. I walk into the bathroom and I look and I actually got a really crappy haircut. But I felt fantastic. I was feeling like I was on top of the world, so confident. I smelled right. I felt so confident. But I looked in the mirror and I had a cowlick that was so bad I'm using a hairdryer and a wet cloth to try to get the hair to sit down. And whenever I could, I started scheduling my haircuts, whether I was visiting England, which is the original home, this is the original Truford and Hill, but became addicted to haircuts at Truford and Hill. And uh, there was a joke in my family that uh, my wife was saying, are you too good to get your haircut here in Minnesota that you now have to get a haircut internationally, either in Canada or, or in, in the UK? Is it logical for a guy to be getting his haircuts in Canada or the UK? No. So this unconscious and emotional aspect has influence on our buying decisions as we put all those signals together. And we've learned more in the last decade about science and uh, around neuroscience and psychology than in the entire history of those disciplines. And in work that I did with uh, Jerry Saltman at the Harvard Business School, we learned that the tangible attributes of a product or service actually have less influence on consumer preference than the subconscious sensory and emotional elements derived from the total experience. So advances in psychology have told us that 95% of our thought takes place unconsciously and without awareness. So what becomes critical is the traditional way that we've looked at gathering understanding is what people say, what they think. And what we need to begin to understand is how patients, how families think, how customers think, how employees think, not just what they think, but how they think. So we consciously and unconsciously filter this barrage of clues. We organize them into a set of impressions. Some are rational, some are emotional. If you concentrate on the red dot on this young lady's nose for a moment, and just stare at that red dot. And in a second, I'm going to switch to a white screen. When I do, please blink rapidly. Ready? Blink, 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 blink. The way that our mind works is it takes these signals and adds meaning to them. So every signal in an experience, our mind is processing. So you may have seen the picture turn color and actually slide off to the side. Our brains are constantly interpreting signals around us. 
and filling in the white space, which is ultimately how we end up feeling. So these clues are quite simple. The clues are what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and feel. There are functional clues, there are categories of clues that we break things into and people do clue math. There are the functional clues, if I buy a cup of coffee, I expect it to be hot, if I want hot coffee. There are those mechanic clues that are the sights, smells, sounds, and textures, and those tend to be more impactful on our emotions. And then there are the humanic clues that are actually stimuli associated with people and the choice of words, tone of voice, level of enthusiasm, body language, the language that we use online, the colors that we use online, the way that a package arrives. All of these clues come together in the way we do clue math and how it affects the way we feel about an experience. So let's do a quick clue hunt. Here's a hotel room that I stayed in that actually had traveler safety tips. Uh, and it talked about uh, what to do in case of a fire, lock your valuables in the safe deposit box. Uh, and it was uh, information from Inspector McGruff and taking a bite out of crime. I went to bed in this place worrying about waking up the next morning. It is not the way I'm an anxious person. I don't want to go to bed worrying about burning to a crisp. Whereas here in this hotel, on my pillow at night is a mint. Uh, there, it's, it's like storytelling. Uh, tell me about your day and how your day went. Leave us your guest comments. And most importantly, they will bet that I'll be alive in the morning and will actually prepare breakfast for me and take the risk rather than warn me that I might not make it through the night. These unconscious clues have a huge effect. Toilet paper can tell us an awful lot. Toilet paper uh, is something where I checked into a hotel room, I see a missing thing here. There's an absence of a clue. This caused me to wonder who was there before I got there or whether the room had never been cleaned because we've become accustomed to the toilet paper triangle. And that toilet paper triangle creates a sense of reassurance. Now in marketing, some may say, well, two triangles are better than one. Uh, three must be better than two. We'll end up, uh, not everyone executes it well. Some people uh, don't execute it very well at all. Or we could get into toilet paper origami. And the question becomes, when is it a nice touch or too much? So really understanding the power of clues and the impact of clues is so critical. Because if we have a set of random clues that don't tie together to an emotional base, an impact that we want to make, we just have a random set of clues. When we align those clues, we create that impression, that emotional impression, that invisible connection of neurons that connect how we feel about ourselves and how we feel in an experience. So when we look at improving something like a patient experience or any experience, as we head to 2030, there are five absolutes in experience management. The first is moving from the world of sensing, of making and selling to sensing and responding. Making, no, making sense out of noise. And traditionally clues would be seen as noise that go unnoticed. The ability to sense what customers themselves don't even know they desire or feeling. The second absolute of under ensuring that we're moving forward in the world of experience management is thinking customer back both in an unconscious, emotional, and rational set of impressions. We need to understand and leverage the role of the unconscious mind. We need to become clue conscious. And then we need rigorous systems to develop and manage and sustain the new paradigm. And it's about a way of doing business 
versus something that we bolt on to a business. This is essential because the ultimate value that any organization creates is the experience. And as Peter Drucker said in many years ago, a management guru, the purpose of a business is to create value. The reward is profit. And in the industrial age, the reward became how do I continue to live in this world and continue to extract more value. So we have a very simple methodology that is populated by very distinctive tools. It's literally a scientific method. It's learn, create, do. But what ties all of that together is ultimately arriving at what we call an experience motif, the North Star. What is it that people on a base level, human needs, desire feeling? And experiences are built on a triangle. Basic needs in terms of pattern recognition across all segments. The next level is cultural differences and then the top of that pyramid is individual uh, clues and signals. But what we've done is, as we over-segment, we forget what makes people the same versus what makes them different. So building that experiential platform on unconscious thought that resides in every culture, in the primitive part of our brain around fear, around all these different emotions that are evoked by these clues becomes essential. That becomes a North Star for experience design. What I like to talk about is emotional clutching power. One of our clients, Lego, has a, a basic principle of engineering Lego blocks and they call it clutching power. It takes the same amount of torque because they're engineered to fit together, to come apart identically. And they're very, 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 very precise in the way they come together. Clues in an experience are very much like Lego blocks. And they need to be engineered so that they fit together to create that emotional connection that construct will then lead to an experience motif. This is one for healthcare uh, that we will cause patients and families to feel blank, blank, and blank. Those emotions become so critical in experience design and the delivery of a, a culture that understands the emotional end frame, that North Star. A simple thing like a double pat on the back of a chair when offering a chair feels very different than just pointing to a chair and saying, here, have a seat. Very different effect, very different emotional feeling. The actual words that are chosen, whether it's online, whether it's writing documents, whether it's letters. We have actually developed programs around speaking the language of the organization. This is a healthcare organization and we did an analysis of their language, both in printed material, online, in call centers, etc., and claims, and could extract phrases that worked against this motif and those that reinforced the motif. And this was actually, uh, there were several of these done. This was quick tips for writers, people who are writing, whether it's writing for uh, the internet and social media, <clears throat> what are phrases to avoid, what are phrases that, Im that build on this emotional connection. Uh, being able to clue scan and understand what clues work in that 
clues that are commoditized, clues that are negative, and clues that are distinctive and differentiating. So this is just a sample of a number of articles that I'm willing to share with anyone. Just drop me an email. I'd be more than happy to share any of these articles that deal with everything from how we remember experiences to uh, quality and the effect and fusion of Six Sigma with experience management, etc. And I think what becomes extraordinarily evident is that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. This is a quote that I see more and more almost every year since we first started using this by Maya Angelou. So with that, I would like to say thank you so very, very much for this opportunity to urge you to learn from best practices, but look toward next practices. Nothing is actually plug and play in a bolt-on system. It's a systematic view of this is the end frame that I want to get to, and it's a way of doing business. I can't thank you enough. Uh, it means so much to me always to share this message, but especially to share it with this group today and on behalf of an organization on behalf of Michigan State that realizes that this is what the future of business is all about. Thank you so very, very much. And I wish you all absolutely fantastic experiences despite the crisis and the world that we live in today. Make the most out of every experience you can. Thank you so very much. And thank you, Lou. Um, if you'd like to learn more from Lou, please join us in the live Q&A, which follows this presentation. Just click on the subsession um, below this session to join a live Zoom chat where you'll find Lou and our moderator for this session.